one of the things that was taught back then, and this was just general consensus, I think, among the scholars, is that there isn't a lot of evidence. And what I find is that they just sort of are, are sometimes locked into their paradigm, you know, that this is what they were taught, this is a worldview. We've got, uh, we've got the Bible going to jail before it's even been convicted of a crime. Yeah. Is there evidence for the Bible? A lot of people today say no. Some new archaeological research has been taking place the last several years that has uncovered some incredibly interesting things. And some of this might change your mind. So I want to encourage you to be open to the conversation that we're going to have today. With that, I want to introduce to you my new friend, Dr. Scott Stripling. Scott, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and just kind of tell us about your, uh, maybe your, your title, your university that you work for. And, and I know you do a lot of archaeology. So uh, give us a little bit of background. Hi, AJ. Thanks for having me on. I am 61 years old as of a few days ago, married for 40 years, four grown children and six grandchildren. I'm the provost and director of donor relations at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas, which is in southwest Houston. I also oversee our 3J Museum and Archaeological Institute. Um, I have a PhD in ancient Near Eastern archaeology. I'm also a seminary grad and um, been directing excavations in Israel for about a quarter of a century. And currently, since 2017, have been the director of excavations at ancient Shiloh, Israel's first capital. That is super cool. Um, and, and lots of questions for you. Uh, I, of course, am a seminary grad too. Uh, went to really a very conservative seminary. And I, I remember one of the things that was taught back then, and this was just general consensus, I think, among the scholars, is that there isn't a lot of evidence for uh, some things in the Bible. Obviously, I think you're going to contradict that on our show today and tell us about some really cool things that you found in your archaeological research. Uh, the tabernacle at Shiloh, the Mount Ball curse tablet. But maybe before we get into some of that stuff, just kind of briefly tell the skeptic out there why they're wrong. Why is there... you? You've been over there, boots on the ground, uh, mm. researching. You just said a quarter of a century. That's a lot of time. Uh, wh why is the skeptic wrong when they say there's no evidence for the Bible? Well, I mean, I, I hate to draw battle lines like, you know, it's it's us against them because I appreciate people who bring a critical approach to to anything. You know, we, we certainly need to hold things up and be skeptical because there's a whole lot of pseudo archaeology that's floating around that we need to, you know, be aware of. Um, but I, I, I think we also have to be careful not to have an assumption of guilt for the Bible when we have a presumption of innocence for other ancient Near Eastern literature. Um, I personally have found hundreds, maybe even a thousand synchronisms between the archaeological data and the biblical text. And so, you know, we excavate 2,000 pieces of pottery a day, AJ, and, you know, everything wow. else you can imagine, coins and stone vessels and cultic items and glass and houses and walls and, you know, everything we have in our houses they had in theirs, and, you know, except the electronics. And, <laughs> you know, not a cell phone yet, huh? No, not yet. Um, <laughs> you know, and then I've, I've excavated a number of sites uh, across the region. So it's not just like a site specific awareness, but it's a regional uh, approach. And, I've not found the contradiction that, that my uh, some of my secular colleagues have uh, have often warned me about. To the contrary, I find a verisimilitude or a consistency between what I read in the text and what I find in the material culture. And what I find is that when I invite people to engage in a dialogue with me, that it you, it doesn't materialize. But, you know, they just sort of are are sometimes locked into their paradigm. You know, that this is what they were taught. This is a worldview. And we can all be guilty of circular reasoning. You know, it's easy to fall into that. But anyway, that's my opinion of why may perhaps the skeptics are seeing things that are a bit clouded. It is interesting that comes out in a place where you would think the attempt would be to, to be non-biased. That would be the, the, the primary goal. I like the way you said that about the proven guilty or gu guilty before proven innocent, you know, kind of approach. Yeah, the and assumption of guilt. We've got the Bible going to jail before it's even been convicted of a crime, yeah. you know. And, well, and that's, I'll give you an example. You take, say, the Amarna <laughs> tablets, uh, which, of course, come from Egypt, from the reign of Amenhotep III, 14th century, and, uh, you know, the, all the dates and the geography and, and the names and so forth the toponymy in that, everybody assumes that that's real, you know, that those are real places and real people and real events. 
but then we read about, and really it's a synchronization with, with the conquest, with the biblical conquest. Then you read the biblical account of the conquest, and there's an assumption that it's mythology, that it can't possibly be true. They're just both telling the same story. One gets an assumption of innocence, the other of guilt. Yeah. Just to kind of get to the heart of the matter as we talk about biblical archaeology, I think there's a lot we can say about different evidences. But, you know, you, you've been at the heart of a couple of places in particular. One of these is this tabernacle thing in Shiloh. And uh, so I want to talk about that in a moment. But first, the thing that you're talking about everywhere is this Mount Nebal curse tablet. And so can you kind of just tell people about that? What What is it? Um, mm -hmm. Explain that a little bit. And, and, and why is it significant in terms of a biblical discovery? Well, my research focus is on the period of the conquest in the highlands of Israel. And so we spent many years excavating Kerbet el Makadar, which is a likely candidate for biblical I or AI of Joshua 7 and 8. The next site the Israelites went after that was Mount Ebal. And so that was on my radar, and we had an opportunity to explore another conquest period site. Um, unfortunately, it's in a very sensitive political uh, area within Judea Samaria, or the so-called West Bank. Uh, we were not able to excavate there, but we were able to extract the dump pile. And all, all digs leave behind discard piles after they've checked the material. And using a new technology that we have perfected called wet sifting, uh, by which we wash the matrix. We don't only dry sift it, but then we wet sift it or we wash it. It changes everything. And what I had found from the tests that I had done is that we've been throwing away, we archaeologists have been throwing away about 75% of the evidence in the wow. past. Wow. And so that's just mind-boggling. Like, I'll give you an example. For every one scarab or bula or glyptic find that an archaeologist published, we're finding four in their dump pile. Oh, my and goodness. Using wet sifting. So yeah. this is what I wanted to go through Adam Zertal's dump piles on Mount Ebal. Um, I, I never expected that I was going to find a curse tablet on the mountain of the curse because to just sort of remind your, your listeners— um, Moses instructed the Israelites when they came into the land and got a foothold, pronounce blessings from Mount Gerizim, curses from Mount Ival, and the Abrahamic covenant was cut right there at El Amore, and that's why they were supposed to go back to that spot. And then Joshua 8.30 says that Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal to the Lord. Adam Zertal discovered that altar in the 1980s. It was his dump piles that we then examined, and from which we found this very small curse tablet. Okay, so so just to give people a little bit of biblical background, um, basically God has the Israelites go to these two different mountains, these adjacent mountains, and shout the blessings from the covenant and the, and from the other mountain, Mount Ebal, the curses. That was where they were shouting the curses, uh, like you just explained. And so you found there this curse tablet, and and I actually have a picture of it. I'm showing people this. Uh, the the tablet is is small. Is it about the size of a quarter? Am I right in saying that? Let's let's say if you took a, a business card and folded it in half, that would be about the size. Okay, and, and I mean it looks kind of like a like a, a tostito, like a little you know kind of um, <laughs> maybe a, a dried out stale uh, uh, a triscuit or something. What? It, how is that a tablet? It almost looks like I can see a seam on it, but how do you know what's inside of it? Uh, yeah, well that's interesting. See, uh, this is a known quantity. We've seen many of these. In archaeology, it's called a defixio. And so cursed tablets are a genre. Um, bless, blessing tablets are not, but cursed tablets are. <laughs> and it goes all the way back. You have the Egyptian execution texts and, you know, well-known examples. But this idea of the folded lead tablet is very ancient. Um, think about Job 19.25, for example, if you, many people would think Job is the oldest book in the Bible, uh, back to the late Bronze Age. Um, Job writes, oh, that my words were written on a lead tablet with an iron pen. And th this idea of being able to write and it becomes binding has an assumption of literacy. And this is one of the big issues that comes into play here is we've been told by, by many people in academia for several generations that Moses and Joshua were not literate. They could not have possibly right. written these accounts when they purport to have been written. Now, for your Christian listeners, they might want to begin with what Jesus said, that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. That's a good place to start. 
But, um, you know, if, if they're truly not literate, then that means that, for example, the documentary hypothesis could actually be true. Maybe this stuff wasn't redacted until much, much later. What we now have, I believe, is evidence of very early alphabetic script, uh, including the name of God on it and including wow. a, a series of curses. So at a biblical site where it says they were proclaiming the curses. Um, so that that idea that Moses and Joshua weren't literate and could not have written really doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny you say that because in seminary, that's what I was uh, that's what I remember hearing. And, and I, mm-hmm. again, I went to a conservative seminary. I loved it there. I mean, these are wonderful, you know, spirit filled men, um, uh, saved people who, you know, have done a lot for the kingdom. But that was just I think they were going in large part off the information, the scholarly uh, uh, consensus yeah. Of, of the oh. time, that there just wasn't a lot of evidence. And, and one of the things that I heard was that there was no writing until after the captivity, which, you know, I think this this find would go against that, that these things weren't written down until mm. after the Israelites come back from the Babylonian captivity. That's, I mean, that's like, that's like a thousand years after the events of the Exodus, basically, you know, so, <clears throat> so which is untrue. That's not true. But this, this curse tablet seems to support the idea that there was a literate biblical culture, like you're saying here. There's actually a, I don't know if you can explain, we have a picture of the inside of this uh, graham cracker cookie, and it's like, it looks like, I don't know if it was scanned, like through an x-ray or something like that. Is that how you got to yeah. the inside of it? And, and could you explain what's what's in there? It looks like some ancient Hebrew, proto-Hebrew writing or something like that. <laughs> well, we were not able to open the tablet um, because it was very brittle. It's 3,400 years old, so it was very brittle. Right. Um, not not that it would break if you held it in your hand, but if you tried to open it, which we did. We put a, the slightest amount of pressure in our lab and the, the corner, t- tiny corner broke. We then used that broken piece of lead and tested it at Hebrew University. So we were able to determine exactly where the lead came from. So we know the actual mine wow. from which it derived. But we didn't want to, of course, damage the tablet. So ultimately, I was able to find, with the, the help of a colleague, the uh, a lab in Prague, Czechoslovakia, that had a track record, track record using tomographic scanning to penetrate lead, which is something I didn't even know you could do at the time. But sure enough, you can. And through a series of high-tech tomographic scans, we were able to see the inside of the tablet. And the first letters that I began to see blew my mind because, and I had formed a a collaborative team of of epigraphers and scholars to work with me at at this point. And, but when I saw the letters, I knew for myself what they were. Not only was it Hebrew, it was proto-alphabetic Hebrew, what has often been called proto-Canaanite or proto-Sinaitic, but no one had the guts to call it proto-Hebrew. Um, and now here we had, you know, proof that indeed it was. So it's pretty awesome. And so then one of the things maybe we're suggesting is, and I'm assuming this is what you're getting to, is that Hebrew probably is the first alphabet in the history Mm -hmm. books always say Phoenician is the the first alphabet, but potentially a discovery like this may show us that Hebrew predated Phoenician. I, I think we could say that um, the first alphabet derives from Egypt. Um, that's that that the hieroglyphs that you mean? Pretty, yeah, you've got an alphabet that's that's evolving from Egyptian hieroglyphs. You know, you have, for example, <clears throat> an ox head, which is a, a symbol in Middle Egyptian, that is morphing into the Hebrew aleph, and and we so we have a number of examples of these. What I'm going to call a proto-alphabetic uh, a script. So yes. I was also taught that the alphabet came from Phoenicia, but I no longer believe that. And, and so what are some of these letters? I, I think I see the letter hey in there. Am, am I right in saying that? Like the hallelujah, it looks like the guy giving the hallelujah. It's the Hebrew letter, like our H, um, which, which actually is why our letter H looks the way that it does. Am I, am I correct? But yeah. what, what is the, what is, what does this tablet say? Because we, we, we're looking at some, it looks <clears> like some <throat> stick figures and some letters. I think the, the letter Aleph is in there as well. What does it say? Yeah, well, in our opinion, and let me just first say that we can't say with certainty what it says, because it's in in a proto-alphabetic script, 
it's not standardized. It doesn't read right to left or left to right or top to bottom or bottom to top. It can be all over the place. Um, even what we call boustrophodon or as the ox plow. So it can go one way, then back the other and reverse, reverse course. This tablet was never intended to be opened, okay? <clears throat> and so the, the, and it's a very small space on which the scribe is writing. And this is typical of uh, inscriptions. Look at like Serebet El Halim in, in the Sinai, and this is what they, they look like. Um, so all I can say is my opinion and my, my collaborative team of epigraphers, to the best of our ability, we think that it says something like, uh, cursed are you by the God Yahweh or Yahu, the three letter spelling of, of Yahweh, which is the older spelling, by the way, cursed, cursed you are, cursed you will surely die. And you have the, the name of God twice with, within there, if we're reading it correctly. What we did in our academic publication in Heritage Science, which came out a couple of months ago, and in the popular article that I just released, was we said, here's why we think it says this. And here's, to the best of our ability, the text. And now other scholars can have at it. And AJ, every inscription that's ever been published that has a biblical significance, there's a variety of, of opinions and thoughts and interpretation on it. But we wanted people to know, you know, from our studying it for 18 months, um, I thought it was my responsibility to publish it and to give an interpretation to it. Um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, just just amazing. Now, are there any critics to any of this thought process or or what it's saying? To, I, I guess to the to the Mount Ebal curse tablet. Is there is there a different view on this thing? Uh, there are many different views. Um, and as I said, go back and look at the Kerbic Kayafa Ostrakhan, which is up until now the oldest Hebrew that we had. And you've got, I think, 11 different interpretations that are <laughs> that are out there, you know, after it was released. So we had we had uh, and this one, I think the stakes are very high because this correlates directly with the biblical text. It's yeah. a biblical place. And it's it's dealing even with the timeline of the, the exodus and the conquest. You know, it d is the biblical date a valid date, which I believe it is. You may know that I wrote the wrote chapter one for five views in the Exodus Zondervan's text published in 2021 and gave all the reasons why that was pre curse tablet. Right, uh, right. If you will. So yes, there's a lot of a lot of people who before it was even published said, oh, it can't possibly be. And they're just imagining this and or it's a forgery. <laughs> I thought I wish I was smart enough <laughs> to I wish I was you smart forged it or what? forge a proto alphabetic script, you know, inside this thing from a Triscuit. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard any alternate readings yet, although I'm sure that other scholars will be coming out with them. But as far as skepticism of, of the validity, there, there has been some of that. There's been broadly embraced um, and, and cheered and then uh, also broadly jeered by others. OK, well, hey, so was Jesus, you know. Yeah. So, well, so, yeah. uh, it, I mean, just, any, anything so else? I mean, just in summation on on the uh, on the curse tablet here. Well, I, I hope people will read read the articles. Uh, like I said, the academic they're both available on my academia.edu page. The uh, the peer reviewed article in Heritage Science is there, and the popular article in Bible and Spade is there. Hope people will read it, think about it. I've certainly talked about it in public. They can find videos uh, of me talking about it and giving all kinds of details. Um, I would just say this, if it is true and if we are correct, then that's a powerful synchronism between yeah. the what the Bible says and what we find in the historical archaeological record. And there are ramifications of that and even theological ramifications, because this tablet is inescapable. You're cursed by the God Yahweh, not by Satan. You know, you could deal with that. How are you going to deal with this? Yeah, I, I mean, the fascinating thing is, and just in terms of dating this, something like this, it has, interestingly, it has that proto-Sinaitic, proto-Phoenician, proto-Hebrew script on it. I mean, it doesn't have like a modern form of Hebrew. A am I correct in saying that? Yeah, but first I want to finish my thought. Oh, I okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I was, I was saying that you're cursed by uh, the God Yahweh, so that's inescapable, except for the fact that it was placed on the altar. And so... This came from within the altar, and of course the purpose of the altar was to shed innocent blood to cover the guilty. And so the picture is that only the blood covers covers the curse. So okay, I think people okay. can reach their own conclusions uh, theologically from that. Right, right, right. Well, you just gave me a sermon. I'm a pastor, you know, and I just I just I mentally got a sermon right there. So <laughs> appreciate so that. I'm, 
What what was your your? Yeah, I just said in terms of dating it. I, to me, one of the interesting things it seems to have that proto Hebrew uh, Hebraic right. script in it. It doesn't have like a, you know a Babylonian script in it. It seems to have that proto script in the yeah. tablet, which would date it pre anything right. else that we have. I mean, probably to the time of Moses or Joshua. You know. Well, that's right. So there's three ways that we date it. Number one is the epigraphy. So the 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 script is definitely late Bronze Age. Um, number two, the archaeological context. Adam Zertal only had two strata at Mount Ebal, Late Bronze Age two and Iron Age one. And even if it was Iron Age one, which would be not very likely, um, it would still be older than any inscription that we have to this point, yeah. any Hebrew inscription that we have. And then number three, from the source of the lead, because this lead came from Greece, and all archaeologists agree on a few things, and one of them is that exports from the Aegean to Canaan ceased around 1200. And so it comes from a mine in Greece. And so using those three things, we can triangulate and I think arrive you know, pretty confidently at a late Bronze Age day. Yeah, just uh, just amazing. And uh, folks, if you haven't done it, check it out. Uh, wh- where can they see the information again? Just so tell the folks where they can where they yeah, can look at some of those articles. Goes to my page at academia.edu. They can download both both articles there, and um, or you know, search my name out there, and I'm sure lots of stuff will pop up. Awesome. Well, hey guys, great discussion here with Dr. Scott Stripling, and this is just the start. So uh, uh, if you are viewing this on our social platforms, then I want to encourage you. It's going to end here, but you can get this interview in its full context at PastorAJ.com. Just become a subscriber for $7 a month, and uh, you can see the next part of this conversation where we're going to talk about the tabernacle platform in Shiloh. Tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Scott. Like, what, what is this, this, this tabernacle platform? I was fascinated mm. by this when I first saw you speak on it. It might have been about a year or two ago I saw. I think at the time it was an old YouTube video. <clears throat> uh, wow. A lot of people don't realize the Jewish temple actually was the tabernacle before that, and it lived in Shiloh for uh, a number of years before, was it a hundred years or? No, over three centuries. Okay, 300, okay, three centuries then. It lived, it was in Shiloh. Yeah. And uh, that was before it was moved by David to Jerusalem. So uh, tell us a little right. bit about what you found in Shiloh. Yes, well, I published an article before our dig ever began in 2017. I published a 2016 article on the possible locations of the tabernacle at Shiloh. And I gave all the reasons why, you know, it might be here and might be there. It was, I was, <laughs> what we have found contradicts all of that. So I've already told you about my recent trip to the Middle East and the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. But what you may not know is that you can experience these things for yourself. And it's all made possible through our friends and ministry partners at DiscoverSinai.com, where Andrew Jones and his team will take you on an adventure of biblical proportions to places like Noah's Ark, the Pyramids of Egypt, the real Mount Sinai and Red Sea crossing site, the Split Rock of Horeb, Elijah's Cave, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Jerusalem. I can't emphasize enough just how incredible this opportunity is. It will be life-changing for you and your family. And here's the cool part. You can do the whole tour or just book the individual things you'd like to see. And the prices are amazingly reasonable for this all-inclusive spiritual experience. Book your tour today at DiscoveredSinai.com. Hey, there's one more thing I've got to share with you. I want you to know that you know Jesus and that you will one day be resurrected and spend an eternity with him. The Bible says that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That all you need to do is confess Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So just say this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need a savior. I believe that you died for my sins and that you were raised to life three days later. Make me born again in my heart through the power of your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, you are saved. Now go get yourself a Bible so that you can begin to develop godly habits in your life and make sure to join a Bible-believing local church where you can be baptized as an outward symbol of what God just did in your heart. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, send us a message and we'll get one to you. Welcome to the family, friend.